Okay, welcome to uh, comparing uh, CF serverless uh, environments. Um, this talk is uh, going to be interesting in the sense that it's different from what you've heard from serverless. It's also um, something that started out of conversation in the hallways at Pivotal, like a lot of things tend to happen with CF. Um, I'm Max, and this is my colleague, Nima. He actually probably could present everything because he did the most of the work. Uh, he just uh, happened to uh, to be stuck with me. <laughs> so I'll try to make it short and sweet. Um, what we want to try to do is to discuss a series of questions around serverless and also uh, at the end kind of discuss also where we're heading um, as IBM, you probably heard of us discussing OpenWhisk and different serverless environments uh, that, that we are essentially trying to sell. This is not going to be one of those talks where we're selling that. As a matter of fact, that's part of the challenge here. Uh, so we'll get started, and then you'll see at the end where we are trying to encourage you to participate. So what is serverless computing? Um, there are different definitions, but at the end of the day, it's just a web function, right? It's the ability to execute some kind of a remote function uh, from your program. Hopefully, it would be something that reacts to some event. So for instance, you have an IoT, like uh, some of the um, common demos around serverless. So you have a, some kind of an internet of thing that's like telling you, for instance, the weather, and then you want to execute some computation around that. Uh, and Typically, it will be lightweight, um, stateless, and hopefully cheap, because you don't have to keep the container or the VM wherever that code is executing. You can just execute it when you need it. So it's very reactive, event-based, and hopefully uh, short and sweet. Sort of like CGI. Uh, <laughs> a few people at Pivotal, when we were chatting, kind of compared it with that. And I'm sure on the web, they do the same. I think it's a little bit different, but it's similar. So what are some questions around serverless, and why did we start this work to compare them? Well, obviously, the first question being part of CF should be, well, why don't you just use Cloud Foundry already, right? I mean, we provide all these things, and then people will say, well, with Cloud Foundry, you spin up an app. You can even do better because you'll have a log. You'll have tons of information about what's going on. Why do you reinvent what we've already done with PaaS? I see some people smiling because that's a common question. I think. It's a fair point, uh, but the people doing serverless will tell you it's a little bit different too, right? Because you, you can build a workflow around some of those web functions. So if you look at our solution, OpenWhisk, and even Amazon's or Azure's, you'll see that the UI allows you to sort of set up a workflow around different functions. That's a little bit harder to do with CF because then you'll have to have different apps and so on. So it's a little bit different. It's a different model for programming, I think. But there are still questions around that, right? Like, so what's the advantage? What are the advantages? Of course, cost performance from the perspective of the person operating a serverless environment, as well as the person using a serverless environment is a big question. So can you, can you kind of compare those? Um, and then, of course, could you just use CF, right? That's a typical question. So our goals is not to make another CF proposal. Because in some ways, we want this to be separate from CF, although there's some relationship. And we also can't possibly explore all serverless environment, even though the solution that we have, once we make it open source and we intend to, um, we will, you will be able to try other serverless environments. Okay, so that's, that's part of it. And again, of course, you know, the big problem with this talk, I can tell you up to right before walking to this door, uh, I had people from IBM needing to want to see our slides because they want to make sure that we're not trying to favor things. And of course, since we're IBM, we're comparing things. How does it look? So you'll see we had to dumb down things a little bit. Uh, so you'll have to go run the experiments yourself so that you can compare them if you want. We actually look pretty good, but we're not the best in every category. So it's kind of like, OK, uh, I can't even say that. So maybe I'm in trouble already. <laughs> So just heard you just heard the best part, you know. Um, 
It's also not, not a full suite of tasks. Um, I think that would take a longer effort, but it's a, it's a good beginning. So the way I like to say it is, you know, we used to be uh, as a company and we're, we're trying to get there where, you know, we not only participated, but we led, we were the leaders and we would help lead efforts. And I think that's where we are with serverless. We wanna help lead the, the, the movement. So think of this as potentially a contribution in that direction. So the approach that we're taking is to essentially try to figure out which is best but by defining some experiments and then running those experiments and sharing the results and repeating. So very simple, very classic, um, you know, in some ways, uh, uh, scientific method of which uh, both Nima and I have background in, in uh, you know, academia. So we're trying to do the same, but not fully with the rigor of a scientific paper. So with that, I'll pass it to Nima, but first thing I want to mention is that we've looked at all of these environments. So Azure, obviously, is the Microsoft Functions. It's in beta. OpenWhisk, which is our solution, which is in beta also. Lambda is the only one that's public right now. Iron.io, uh, I'm not sure they are fully beta, but they're certainly part of it. And then this thing in the middle called CF Serverless that uh, Couple of people at Pivotal, one in particular, he doesn't want to be named. <laughs> uh, I work with him on Bosch, so you know, um, that actually hacked up this version. So with that, I'll pass it to Nima, who will talk about the result. But he actually is going to do a cool demo too, so. All right, thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, so um, I'm Nima, and I'm Kev Caviani, and um, I'm a contributor to Diego Runtime full-time, and this is uh, what we did on the side to understand so, so CF serverless, or basically serverless systems as a whole. Um, so as Max mentioned, when we started thinking about understanding these different serverless systems, we decided that we wanted to have a way to see what the underlying architecture is like. And that's one of re the reasons we went about um, implementing CF serverless. So out of the discussions that we had with folks at Pivotal, we decided that, okay, let's implement something on top of Cloud Foundry that more or less emulates the behavior of a serverless system. And then based on the lessons that we learn, we go and understand what is the overall behavior of serverless systems in general. So we implemented CF Serverless as an application on top of Cloud Foundry, which can actually turn off and turn on other applications. So if you have a function that you want to run, and if you want it to be serverless, you can deploy it as a Cloud Foundry application. And then there's a layer on top that manages that application. When the requests come to that application, it goes and starts the application, brings the application up, responds to your request, and then if the application is idle for some, uh, some time, it takes the application down. And by doing it, by just turning on and turning off of the application, it saves on resources, and essentially saves on money. So once we did it, then we realized, okay, so that's a very basic implementation of serverless on top of Cloud Foundry, and now, what are the lessons that we learned from it? And what experiments can we conduct in order to understand how the other systems behave? So we went and uh, basically thought about the possible experiments, and we built a system that would allow us to run those experiments. So I'm going to show you a demo of what the system is. But basically, before that, I'm going to tell you what experiments we came up with. So the first thing that we decided to do was to understand the behavior of these serverless systems on their high throughput and low throughput loads. Um, so basically, if you have a function that is constantly receiving calls, um, then what is the behavior of the system? And if it's only frequently receiving calls, then what is the behavior of the system then? Why is this important? It's because essentially when you have a function that runs as a serverless function, what happens is that the code gets loaded into a container, right? And that container has a lifetime. Usually, CF ser like serverless systems are short-lived containers because they want to save on resources, they kill the, con the container as soon as the function um, has done with its job, right? So the question is how long this container stays around for it to be responsive and at the same time be cheap. The way we implemented our approach, as I mentioned, we kill the container if it sits idle immediately. Um, the problem with it is that the next time you call that function, because you have to bring the container back up and redeploy the code and all of that, it's going to take time, right? So the question for high throughput versus low throughput was, what is the approach that other uh, serverless technologies are using? 
The other things that we did were like typical performance measurements, uh, memory intensive computation, and uh, we did it by um, doing matrix multiplications. Two 300 by 300 uh, matrix, we multiplied them, and we, this is a known uh, memory intensive problem, and so we measured the amount of time that it actually takes for different functions to respond. For CPU intensive, we did a uh, finding of prime numbers, and that's a very common uh, CPU intensive function. We tried it across all the environments that we mentioned. We also looked into container manage management behavior, basically the same thing on, uh, I mentioned, whether the containers stay around, whether they get killed immediately, or whether there's another strategy involved. So for all the experiments that we did, we actually deployed um, because we wanted the, the, the deployments to be similar and close. So we gave every single function in every environment 512 megabytes of memory. And we deployed all of them uh, in US East. Because when you go to these cloud platforms, obviously you can choose where your functions um, are deployed. Except for OpenWhisk, which is, I think, only available in Dallas. So with OpenWhisk, we didn't have that much option. So then we started launching requests to these functions. And we did two ways of launching requests, sequentially, so that every request um, hits the endpoint after the previous one is finished, and then in parallel. So all of the requests hit the endpoint at the same time. And we did it with 100 requests, and we basically did it three times. And we did a ramp up period so that we actually have everything up and running uh, before starting to collect data. OK, so for the demo, this is basically what you need to supply to the, um, to the basic code that runs the experiment. You define all the different uh, environments. You define the endpoints, and you, you define the type of headers and the type of um, bodies that um, are going to be passed to these HTML calls. Because at the end of the day, these, uh, these serverless functions are just HTML, like uh, HTTP endpoints that you hit. Um, and once you provide everything in the right format for those functions, it's just a simple HTTP call. Um, so once you provide all those information, then what happens is um, you can define the number of times that actually a function is called, and you can define the time between intervals, basically every two consecutive calls, um, and it just runs it against all the environments that you have, and collects the data and reports the data back. So as you can see, it comes up with um, some numbers on how much time it takes for every one of the environments. So with that, we started running all these experiments against all the environments that I mentioned, and we went to all of these environments, OpenWhisk, Azure, Lambda, Iron IO, and deployed these functions. The functions that we implemented, we implemented the functions in Python. And I believe the code for the experiments and also for the test suite is going to be released hopefully sometime soon. We are planning to make it open source. So let's look into the results. Um, I basically, for each of the experiments, I'm only um, showing one of the environments, the one that I thought was more interesting. Um, if you look at it for a high throughput function, this is basically a simple echo function. You hit the endpoint and it re responds with a simple like hello world. You see that the, all the 100 requests were successful and the average time it took for every request to come back was around like 180 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. Um, and there are spikes in the, um, in the experiments and those are the ones that actually took longer for the, for the container to be set up. So the spikes that you see are the ones that the container wasn't there. So it took probably like close to seven minutes to create the container, put the code on it, and then respond to the first call. But once that first call was through, the remaining calls were actually much faster. That's why the, the average is, in, um, is around 200 milliseconds. Um, so that was the sequential one, right? Where every request came after the, uh, the, the previous one. Then we did it in parallel. And Azure was very interesting because as you see, there is like the steep um, um, basically response time, like the response time increases kind of linearly as the number of requests, as, as we basically push more, um, more um, requests or basically make more calls. And it seems like Azure does not a good job bringing up new containers in order to be able to equally balance the load. I don't know exactly what is behind it, but if they had enough resources to respond to these calls, this should be like a flat line. This is what we observed in some of the other, the better environments. Uh, usually, no matter how many, how many requests you launch towards an endpoint, it was kind of a flat line. But for Azure, it actually spiked up. 
So for low throughput, we actually made it so that the same echo function, rather than um, calling it um, basically one after another exactly, we made it so that there was like a five minute delay or one minute delay between every, every two consecutive calls. The way we implemented CF serverless was that if um, the, the endpoint was inactive for 30 seconds, we would kill the container. We wanted to see what the other platforms do. And we actually played with the time. Uh, here I'm, sh I'm talking specifically about the one minute delay, but we played with five minute delay and 10 minute delay to see whether changing the time would actually affect the time that it takes for the container to respond back. And well, CF serverless, we knew what the behavior was. The container was killed, so every request took around like 10 seconds to respond. But we realized that for other environments, they're actually not killing the container. What they do is that they freeze the container. So they use the C group freezing, and it allows them to free up resources, but keep the container on the disk. So the next time it's called, it's actually slower, sl slightly slower, but not drastically slower. So it's not in the order of like seven like seconds. It's usually in the order in the upper end of um, you know hundreds of milliseconds for for all the other environments that we observe, OpenMisc, Lambda, and Azure. For IronIO, it's different. The thing with IronIO is that it's specifically designed for running um, tasks that are uh, supposed to run only once, but are like heavy in computation. So their implementation was very similar to serverless. They would bring up a container, launch everything into it, do that thing, and then kill it and throw it away. So it would take a lot longer for every single call from um, IronIO to come back. And that was an interesting comparison or observation compared to the other environments. Um, so we did the memory intensive um, function experiment. Um, and in a sequential case, see, this is the usual behavior that you would expect to see from a, ser a serverless function a flat line, the average was um, around you know, 1.3 seconds, and all the requests were successful. Um, now we did it um, in parallel, um, and the interesting one was again Azure. One thing we noticed was that out of the calls, all the calls that we made, only 15% of them were successful, and the other ones basically failed. Um, resources got congested for some reason. Uh, and they couldn't respond immediately. It was usually a timeout or out of memory error that we received when we hit the end. For the other environments, it usually was better. It was, again, kind of like a flat um, line. The other experiment was CPU intensive function, so calculating prime numbers. Um, and what I'm showing you here is a sequential case for CF serverless. And as you can see, except for the spikes that I explained earlier, it's pretty much a flat line. 100% success, and um, each calculation took around 2.5 seconds. Um, and we did it uh, in parallel for OpenWhisk, and you see that as requests come in, it, is, it goes up, like this, this pattern kinda is similar in all platforms, it goes up, but not that much. The overall average was like around, I think this one is actually 26 seconds, so I think I'm, I have a typo here. In the case of sequential, it actually took 26 seconds. And then in the case of parallel, the response was around 8 seconds to 9 seconds uh, for the platforms that we experimented with. So general observations about the experiments that we ran. One thing that we realized was timeout was an issue. And a lot of these um, environments, even though they claim that they actually have configurable timeouts, they really don't. For example, in Amazon, the default is 30 seconds. Um, but if you change it to five minutes, it's still 30 seconds. Like, whatever you do, it's 30 seconds. Uh, for, for Azure, it's not configurable yet. Um, I think in iteration 22, that came out like a few days ago, they made it so that you can configure it. They claim that the default is five minutes. But usually what we observe was that as we hit these endpoints, it would usually time out a lot faster than five minutes. So, yeah, it's still like kind of a sketchy. The other thing is that um, there is this notion of money versus um, uh, time, right? And the general idea is that if you spend more money, obviously you're going to be able to do things faster. And if you think about serverless, even though there are like subtle differences between serverless and a long-running um, long-running program, at the end they are more or less the same. So if you keep the container around for longer, and if you provide more containers and more resources, obviously things are going to run faster. So if you're willing to, to basically spend more money, then essentially you can have good number of containers running your functions in a long-running mod model, and you can 
basically create boilerplate code along all the orchestration that you need between these functions, and you can get something similar. The, the point with CF, server, serverless in general is that it's going to help you significantly in terms of uh, resources, that, in terms of costs of um, using resources that you would use. So the last thing is that the, the experiments that we are running, we're actually moving towards um, creating it something that everybody can use and everybody can run against their environments. We're hoping to be able to release both the code for running the experiments and also the actual um, benchmarks uh, open source so that in case you're interested, you can try it with your, with your own environments. I think with that, I'll yeah. So one thing we want to discuss that I think we, maybe I should have stressed is that a lot of these environments are still in beta. So like OpenWhisk is in beta, Azure is in beta, IronIO, I'm not so sure. Uh, we try to get Google functions and those, not only it's in beta, but you can't even use it. So the point is, numbers we're showing you here are beta, except for Lambda, so keep that in mind. But what we want to do in terms of, you know, where do we go from here is to release something like a spec serverless. So to that extent, what we did is to, we got a draft. It is actually a document, so if you jot down that Google, uh, or you send us email, we'll send it to you. And this is to essentially say there is spec serverless is uh, something we think could be useful and there is going to be a way to run some experiments around it. And obviously part of the idea is not only to release the experiment runners and the experiments publicly, but to get everybody uh, try it on their own environments so that, you know, maybe you can optimize it. And part of the idea of creating a, like, like a spec is, you know how when uh, Intel releases new uh, CPUs, then you can run specant or different um, benchmarks to kind of compare the, um, the CPUs. And I think serverless environment might have a similar uh, potential. So we'd love to hear your opinion about this. Uh, if you're interested, we'd love to have, um, you know, collaboration. This is very early in the, you know, in the stage of where serverless computing is going to go but this is uh, potentially a way for you to get engaged and, and uh, produce something that would be valuable. So with that, we thank you. Uh, you'll find us on Twitter here, and then we can take some questions.